Hi everyone and welcome to our module on renal failure. So let's start by defining a few terms. When we say that someone has acute renal failure, we mean that they have a decrease in their creatinine clearance that usually occurs over several days or maybe even quicker than that. And this type of renal failure is often associated with symptoms and this has many causes. You will often see acute renal failure in hospitalized patients. When we say that someone has chronic renal failure, we mean that they have chronic kidney disease. In fact, chronic renal failure now is often called CKD. And this is a slow, steady deterioration in renal function, usually occurs over years. And this is almost always due to diabetes and hypertension in the United States. And patients with chronic renal failure often don't develop symptoms until they get to the most severe end stages. Azotemia is a general term that means insufficient filtering of the blood by the kidneys. And then the word uremia technically means urine in the blood, but that's when someone has azotemia plus they have so-called uremic symptoms. So this slide lists the symptoms of uremia. So patients who have poor filtering of their blood by their kidneys will develop anorexia. So they lose their appetite and they don't want to eat. They'll be nauseous and they may vomit. Your platelets don't work right when you have uremia, so you can develop bleeding more easily. Pericarditis is a classic symptom of uremia. It's called uremic pericarditis. Asterixis is a tremor or flap when patients extend their arms and hold their hands out. And then encephalopathy is the confusion that goes along with people who have uremia. So now we're going to talk about acute renal failure. And the way acute renal failure typically manifests is you will check blood work on your patients and you will find rising levels of BUN, which is the blood urea nitrogen, and rising levels of creatinine. These two substances are filtered by the kidneys. So if the kidneys start to fail, their levels will rise in the blood. So we're going to talk about the three mechanisms by which patients acutely develop an increased BUN and creatinine, meaning they develop acute renal failure. The first mechanism is if they have insufficient blood flow to the kidneys. This is called pre-renal failure. So if you don't deliver enough blood to the kidneys, then the kidneys can't filter the blood appropriately, even though they may be healthy kidneys. And pre-renal failure happens when patients are dehydrated, when they're in shock and they're not delivering enough blood to their kidneys because blood is leaking out of their vessels or when they have heart failure and they're not pumping enough blood forward to the kidneys. The next type of kidney failure is when there's an obstruction of urine outflow. This is called post-renal failure. And for this to occur, you need to have bilateral obstruction. If just one kidney is obstructed, usually the other kidney can take care of filtering the blood. So this happens when patients have bilateral kidney stones or hypertrophy of the prostate in men, tumors, and some congenital abnormalities. And then the final mechanism by which patients acutely develop renal failure and rising BUN and creatinine levels is when they have renal dysfunction that's intrinsic to the kidneys. And this is from conditions like acute tubular necrosis and glomerular nephritis, which I talk about in other modules. So as I said before, the key lab values for identifying and diagnosing acute renal failure are measurement of the serum creatinine and the blood urea nitrogen. So creatinine is very similar to inulin, and I talk about this in the modules on renal physiology. It's freely filtered with a small amount of secretion. Blood urea nitrogen is also freely filtered, but it is reabsorbed when the kidneys reabsorb water. So in acute renal failure, both the BUN and creatinine are going to rise because less is being filtered. However, in acute renal failure from dehydration or poor flow to the kidneys, that pre-renal type of failure I mentioned, the BUN rises much more than the creatinine. That's because less is filtered, and in addition, more gets reabsorbed in settings of dehydration. So the difference between the amount of increase of creatinine and BUN will help you identify the cause of renal failure. We'll talk more about that in the coming slides. So in actual practice, acute renal failure is usually picked up when routine labs are done on an outpatient or an inpatient who needs those labs drawn for some other reason. And then the BUN and creatinine are found to be elevated. And the workup you usually do for acute renal failure includes your analysis to look for protein, blood, and casts. These are all signs of glomerular problems. You almost always get an ultrasound of the kidneys because hydronephrosis, which is a swollen kidney, will be present when there's an obstruction, and this is an easily reversible cause of renal failure. You take a careful history to look for meds or comorbidities or problems with hydration that may have caused renal failure. The physical exam is key because you want to know if the patient is dehydrated, like has low blood pressure or dehydration or CHF. And then you do check blood and urine chemistry somewhat to identify the cause, but they have a limited use. These other things are much more important. Now in the USMLE, they're going to want you to diagnose acute renal failure using mostly blood and urine testing. And so they're going to give you certain numbers, and you have to know how to use these to determine why the patient has renal failure. They'll tell you the BUN and the creatinine, because both of these rise in renal failure. And they'll also tell you the ratio. A normal ratio is about 20 to 1, and that ratio can be helpful in renal failure. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
then they're also going to tell you the urinary sodium, the fractional excretion of sodium, and the urinary osmosis. So let's talk about these now. So the amount of sodium in the urine is called the urinary sodium, and this varies based on how much sodium and water the patient is taking in. The urinary sodium gets very low when the kidneys are retaining salt and water, and less than 20 milliequims per liter is very low. The fractional excretion of sodium is often written as the FENA, and this is the amount of filtered sodium that gets excreted. And this also gets very low when the kidneys are trying to retain salt and water, and less than 1% is a very low fractional excretion of sodium. Finally, the urinary osmolarity is a measure of the concentrating ability of the kidney. This gets very high when the kidneys are retaining water. Essentially, the kidneys are pulling water molecules out of the nephron and creating a concentrated urine. And greater than about 550 milliosms per kilogram is a very high urinary osmolarity. So now we're going to talk about the three types of renal failure, pre-renal, post-renal, and intrinsic renal, and talk about how to use those measurements to determine the cause of renal failure. So in pre-renal failure, the BUN and creatinine become abnormal. There's decreased blood flow to the kidneys, so less BUN and creatinine get filtered. This means that the level of BUN and creatinine rise in the blood. However, because the kidneys are perceiving less blood being delivered to them, they are going to resorb more water. And when they resorb more water, they pull BUN out of the nephron with them. The result is that the BUN rises much more than the creatinine rises. So when you look at the labs in a patient who has pre-renal failure, you will see that the BUN will have gone up a lot. The creatinine will also have gone up, but not as much as the BUN. And your ratio of BUN to creatinine will be increased. There are also key urinary findings in patients with pre-renal failure. So lots of water is being resorbed from the nephron, so it's a concentrated urine. So you will see high uosms. There's lots of sodium being resorbed, so you will see a very low urinary sodium concentration and a low fractional excretion of sodium. So this is easier to understand if we look at some sample values. So here's a normal patient right here. The BUN is 20 and the creatinine is 1 and the ratio is 20 to 1. In pre-renal failure, where the kidneys are perceiving that they're not getting enough blood, the BUN may be 60 and the creatinine is 20, and this makes a ratio of greater than 20 to 1. Notice that the BUN has tripled while the creatinine has only doubled. This is because of that mechanism of reabsorption of water pulling BUN with it. The urinary sodium, fractional excretion of sodium, and uosms are very variable in a normal patient, but in pre-renal failure, the urinary sodium will get very low, less than 20, the fractional excretion of sodium will be less than 1%, and the uosms will get high, and that's usually over 550. So now let's talk about the lab findings in intrinsic renal failure. So in terms of the BUN and creatinine, the kidneys cannot filter blood because they're not working for some reason. So less BUN and creatinine gets filtered, and you get a rising BUN and creatinine in the blood. However, in this case, there's no extra rise in the BUN from increased resorption, so the ratio of BUN and creatinine will remain normal at about 20 to 1. In the urine, the kidneys are dysfunctional, so they can't resorb water. They can't concentrate the urine. This means the urinosms will be low. The urinary sodium will be high because the kidneys aren't working and they can't resorb sodium. And the fractional excretion of sodium will be high also because the kidneys can't resorb sodium. So here's another example of what the lab values might look like in intrinsic renal failure. So here's our normal patient right here. Their BUN is 20, the creatinine is 1, and their ratio is 20 to 1. And the urinary findings are variable based on the amount of water and salt being taken in. In intrinsic renal failure, the BUN will rise, say, from 20 to 40. That's a doubling. And the creatinine will also double from 1 to 2. This means that the BUN to creatinine ratio will maintain its value at 20 to 1. Urinary sodium levels will be high at greater than 20. Fractional excretion of sodium will be high at greater than 2%. And the urinary osmosis will be low at less than 350. Now let's talk about post-renal failure. And this is the most confusing of the three types to understand in terms of the lab values. This is when you have obstruction to outflow and urine backs up into the kidneys. You get a very high pressure in the tubules and the kidneys can't filter blood. Also, the kidneys' resorptive mechanisms can get damaged or destroyed by that high pressure. In real life, the diagnosis of post-renal failure is very rarely made by checking the plasma electrolytes in the urinalysis. The main features of post-renal failure that you need to know are anuria, so the patients are obstructed and they're not going to be making urine. The other finding is hydronephrosis. The kidneys will be swollen with urine. So renal ultrasound is the test of choice when you suspect post-renal failure. It's going to show enlarged dilated kidneys with hydronephrosis. And that's why we almost always do a renal ultrasound in patients with acute renal failure because we want to rule out that they're obstructed. Now they may ask you on your boards about the urinary and plasma findings for electrolytes in post-renal failure. And the thing to know here is that the plasma urine findings are very similar 
to intrinsic renal failure. The high pressure in the tubules prevents filtration, just like in intrinsic renal failure where the kidneys aren't working. The only exception is the BUN to creatinine ratio. The BUN may rise like prerenal failure, and the mechanism of this is that the high pressure in the tubules forces BUN out of the tubules, so you may see BUN rise more than creatinine, and you may get a high BUN creatinine ratio similar to prerenal failure. In reality, postrenal failure has a lot of variability in the lab values based on the tubules. In early postrenal failure, the tubules can be okay, but then the longer you're obstructed, you can start to damage tubular resorption from that high pressure. And this means that in real life, the urine chemistries are often highly variable. What I've shown you on this slide is the way postrenal failure is often described in a lot of board review books. So they'll show you a normal patient here, like what we've described in past slides. And for postrenal failure, they'll show you a BUN that may be 60, a creatinine that may be 2. And this means you have a high ratio of BUN to creatinine. So they're showing you similar findings to prerenal because that high pressure in the tubules is driving BUN out. For the urinary findings, they're going to show you things that look like intrinsic renals. So the kidneys aren't resorbing sodium, so the urinary sodium is high, the fractional excretion of sodium is high, and the kidneys aren't concentrating well, so the urinary osms are low. But remember, in real life, we usually don't diagnose postrenal failure by looking at the electrolytes. So there are some problems with using those pre-intrinsic and post-renal descriptions I just showed you in the last few slides to diagnose the cause of renal failure. One of the problems is that a lot of diseases cross boundaries. So for example, if you're dehydrated, you may initially get prerenal failure, but if the dehydration becomes severe, that can progress to acute tubular necrosis. So thus, dehydration can cause two different kinds of renal failure. In addition, a lot of patients in the hospital are on diuretics, and this is going to screw up all those urinary sodium values that we just talked about. And then finally, many patients with acute renal failure have pre-existing chronic renal disease, so now you're talking about interpreting plasma and urinary electrolytes in the setting of a patient who is walking around with abnormal levels at baseline. It makes the distinction that we described in the last few slides harder to rely on. So we use these sometimes clinically, but they're not perfect. One thing that does come up often on internal medicine rotations is actual calculation of the fractional excretion of sodium. We can do that fairly easily by measuring the creatinine and sodium values in the blood and in the urine. So the equation for fractional excretion of sodium is the plasma creatinine times the urinary sodium divided by the plasma sodium times the urinary creatinine. And you can get all these measurements by sending a urine and a blood sample on your patient to the laboratory. So in prerenal failure, the fractional excretion of sodium should be less than 1%, and the urinary sodium should be less than 20. In intrinsic renal disease, the fractional excretion will be greater than 1%, and the urinary sodium will be greater than 40. And you will sometimes do this on hospitalized patients with acute renal failure to try and figure out if their renal failure is pre-renal, meaning they need more fluids, or if it's intrinsic renal, meaning their kidneys just aren't working. Now let me talk about chronic kidney disease. So as I said before, this is a slow, steady fall in creatinine clearance, and the blood test will show a steady increase over time of the BUN and creatinine. It eventually progresses to dialysis for many patients, and the most common causes are diabetes and hypertension. Hypertensives get something called hypertensive nephrosclerosis, which makes the kidneys not work, and diabetics get diabetic nephropathy. Chronic kidney disease is split up into five stages based on the GFR. So if your GFR is greater than 90, but you have risk factors for kidney disease, we will call this stage one. Stage two is when the GFR is 60 to 89. Stage three is 30 to 59. Stage 4 is 15 to 29. These patients are approaching dialysis. And then when the filtration rate falls to under 15, most of these patients are on dialysis, and they are stage 5. This is often called end-stage renal disease, or ESRD. You should know the indications for dialysis in a patient with renal failure. So if patients are significantly acidemic, that's an indication for dialysis. Electrolyte abnormalities, especially very high potassium levels, are an indication for dialysis. If a patient is intoxicated with certain dialyzable substances, we'll talk about these in a minute, then they should be dialyzed. We dialyze patients who have evidence of fluid overload, like heart failure, so if they have pulmonary edema because they're not excreting fluid, that's an indication for dialysis. And then finally, any of those uremic symptoms I talked about before mean that the patient needs dialysis. And most people remember all these indications by remembering AEIOU, which is the first letter of each of the indications. So this is a list of some of the dialyzable substances that patients will get dialysis for if they overdose on them or develop serious toxicity. So salicylates and aspirin are dialyzable. So is lithium, isopropyl alcohol, magnesium laxatives, and ethylene glycol. It's very rare to dialyze someone for these, but you can because 
the dialysis machine can remove these substances from the blood. So putting someone on dialysis means hooking them up to a machine that can filter their blood and do the job their kidneys are unable to do. And there are three main ways by which we do this. The first is called hemodialysis. And this is a picture of a man on hemodialysis over here on the right. You can see that there are large tubes connected to his arm. And those tubes are having blood drawn out of them. The blood's going through a filter in the dialysis machine and then being returned to the patient. So obviously hemodialysis requires significant vascular access to get the blood out of the body. The blood's pumped from the body through a filter and then goes back. And this is usually done in sessions a few hours at a time. So patients who are on dialysis will go to a dialysis center three or four days a week for two or three hours of dialysis. And this will do the job that their kidneys can't do. Another option is called peritoneal dialysis. And this is where you cycle fluid into the patient's abdomen and use the peritoneal lining as a filter. Essentially, the peritoneum is the dialysis membrane. This has to be done every night, so patients have to hook themselves up to a machine while they sleep. And this is basically only done for highly sophisticated, motivated patients who are willing to do this at home rather than come into a dialysis center. And then the final method of dialysis is called hemofiltration. This is very slow, constant filtering of the blood. This is usually done at the bedside for critically ill patients. And basically, they're just hooked up to the dialysis machine for hours and days on end while they're critically ill. Vascular access is very important for patients on dialysis. So if someone goes into acute renal failure and needs dialysis, you can place a central line. But these central lines have a lot of problems. They develop infections and they develop blood clots and they don't last. The ideal method is to place something called a fistula. So this is a surgical procedure where a connection is placed between an artery and a vein, usually in the arm. These fistulas have the lowest rate of blood clotting and infection. They're very durable. And so for patients who are going to be on dialysis for the rest of their lives, this is the ideal way to go. The fistula has to mature. So ideally, you place it several months before dialysis. If you're a nephrologist, you're always watching your patients. And when you think they get near dialysis, you recommend a fistula so that it will have time to mature before their kidneys completely fail. There are some complications of chronic kidney disease that you should know about, and the first one is anemia. So you lose erythropoietin when the kidneys don't work, and this can lead to enormousidic anemia. Many patients with chronic kidney disease develop dyslipidemia. Usually it's mostly high triglycerides. We think this happens because patients lose protein in the urine, and this stimulates liver synthesis. Patients with chronic kidney disease also have impaired clearance of some fats in the blood. Children with chronic kidney disease, it's rare for children to have this, but if they do, they can develop growth failure. And then the final complication is something called renal osteodystrophy. So to understand renal osteodystrophy, we have to talk about calcium and phosphate problems in renal failure. So when you have sick kidneys, the kidneys cannot excrete phosphate and the phosphate levels rise. The kidneys also can't activate vitamin D to its active form, so you get low levels of active vitamin D. The high phosphate pulls calcium out of the plasma and lowers the calcium level. And the lack of vitamin D causes decreased calcium absorption from the gut. These two effects combine to cause hypocalcemia. And then the hypocalcemia stimulates the parathyroid gland to make parathyroid hormone levels very high. What this means is that patients with chronic kidney disease can develop what we call secondary hyperparathyroidism. So the low calcium is constantly stimulating the parathyroid gland and raising levels of PTH. It's not primary because the problem is not in the gland itself. It's secondary to the renal failure. Now, if renal failure causes enough stimulation of the parathyroid gland, patients can develop what's called tertiary hyperparathyroidism. This is when the parathyroid gland has been so heavily stimulated by chronic kidney disease that the gland becomes autonomous. The PTH levels can get very, very high, and calcium can become severely elevated, and this often requires a parathyroidectomy because the parathyroid gland is no longer responding to calcium levels. It's gone off and operated on its own like a rogue gland. So now that we understand that, we can talk about the bone problems in patients with chronic kidney disease. So the untreated high parathyroid levels can lead to something called renal osteodystrophy. This is when the bones begin to degrade from chronically elevated parathyroid hormone. Patients complain of bone pain. This is the predominant symptom and they're vulnerable to fractures because they have very weak bones from the high PTH levels. If it becomes severe enough, patients can get what's called osteitis fibrosa cystica. This is from untreated, very high PTH levels for a long time. Patients get cysts in their bones, and they get these things called brown tumors, which are full of osteoclasts and fibrous tissue. And you can see them in this x-ray over here. There are these dark spots inside the bones, and those are brown tumors in a patient who's been exposed to very high PTH levels for a long time and has developed osteitis fibrosa cystica.
Now, when nephrologists treat patients with chronic kidney disease, they try to avoid these bone problems by giving patients drugs called phosphate binders. These bind phosphate in the GI tract and bring the levels down. So these are things like calcium carbonate, calcium acetate, which goes by the name Foslo, and then Sevelomir, which is Renagel, and another drug called Lanthanum. So all of these are designed to combat that problem of very high phosphate levels in patients with kidney disease. Let me finish this module by just reminding you of some of the drugs that can affect renal function. So there are many drugs that worsen kidney function by decreasing the GFR, and these are all associated with rising BUN and creatinine levels in the plasma. So loop thiazide and potassium sparing diuretics can all increase the BUN and creatinine because they interfere with the kidney's ability to concentrate and excrete urine. ACE inhibitors can vasodilate the efferent arterial, and this can drop the GFR. And then NSAIDs can interfere with prostaglandin synthesis, and this can often drop the GFR. So be aware that patients on any of these meds may show evidence of increased BUN and creatinine and may develop acute renal failure. And that concludes our module on renal failure.